All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Forestry Adaptation Community of Practice webinar today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Annette Morand, and I am the facilitator of the Online Adaptation Communities of Practice, which are run by us here at OPR, which is the Ontario Center for Climate Impacts and Adaptation Resources, and we're located at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario. So the way the webinar will run is as follows. So after this short introduction, we'll have the main presentation, which will go for about 40 or 45 minutes. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes for a dedicated Q&A session. But before we get going, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, first, for those of you who dialed into the conference call line, uh, your lines have been automatically muted. And the reason for this is just to avoid any audio distractions or feedback during the webinar. So if you'd prefer to ask a question over the telephone during the Q&A session, all you're going to have to do is dial star six and that will unmute your phone line. Um, but please do keep your lines muted during the presentation. And although we will have a dedicated Q&A session at the end, um, that doesn't mean you actually have to hold your questions until the very end. So as we go through the webinar, please feel free to type out your questions in the chat box area on the left. Um, but just note that we will be addressing those questions at the end. Also, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please hover your mouse over my name and the attendee list and click on Start Private Chat, or you can also email me, which uh, you can find in the chat box area there. I also want to mention that we are recording the webinar today, and I'll be sending out a copy of the recording to all those who have registered for the webinar. And finally, I know we have some people on the line today who may not be familiar with what the Forestry Adaptation Community of Practice, or the FACOP, is. So I want to take this opportunity to quickly mention that it's an interactive online communicate, uh, community dedicated to those who are working in forestry or who are simply interested in forestry and climate change adaptation in Canada. It includes features like an online resource library, news articles, discussion forums, and more. Um, and it's free to join. So if there's anyone on the line today who's interested in learning more, uh, please click on the link in the chat box for more information and to register. So with that being said, we're very excited to have Kevin Williams and Phil Carroll on the line with us today to talk about sustainable buried structures. And just so you know a little bit more about your presenters, Kevin is a technical director of Buried Bridges for Atlantic Industries Limited and is registered as a professional engineer in six provinces. He actively participates in the development of various material and design standards worldwide and is the vice chair and secretary of the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code's Buried Structure Subcommittee. Kevin also actively participates in various industry forums and is chairing the Transportation Research Board Committee on Resilient and Sustainable Buried Structures. And Phil graduated from the British Columbia Institute of Technology with a diploma in Civil and Structural Engineering Technology and graduated from Lakehead University with a bachelor's degree in engineering. His main professional interest continues to be the design and construction of buried structures and working on a daily basis with owners, engineers, and installers. Phil continues to volunteer time and effort to update relevant industry standards and participate in the Corrugated Steel Pipe Institute. So on behalf of everyone joining us, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Kevin and Phil for taking the time to present this webinar for us today. It's very much appreciated. So without further ado, I will now hand things over to you, Kevin. Great. Thank you. Um, so, so welcome, everyone. Uh, so I wanted to start off with just uh, quickly introducing um, Atlantic Industries, for those of you not familiar with it. So Atlantic Industries um, is a privately held Canadian company. Um, we're head office out of New Brunswick. We have uh, um, satellite offices across uh, the country and have an international presence. We are a um, designer and producer and supplier of infrastructure products. On the bottom of the slide there, you'll see we have four main categories. We have, uh, starting on the right, sound wall barriers, retaining walls and abutments, prefab prefabricated bridges, and structural plate and tunnels. Uh, the presentation today is going to be focused on uh, structural plates and uh, tunnels and culverts. And uh, the reason why we're, we're focusing on that is that's really a product line that um, seems to be um, most um, connected to, to climate change and uh, climate change impacts. Um, so at, at the top of the presentation here, you'll see um, Phil and myself, uh, our contact information. Um, looking at the, the registration list, there seems to be quite a variety of uh, backgrounds um, on the call here. So we hope that um, everyone's able to get something out of the, uh, the presentation today. Um, this is a topic that Phil and I are 
both certainly passionate about talking about. And um, one of the thing, things that we're looking forward to today is presenting is also on um, connecting with, with you in, in some way and, and learning more from, from you. So if we move into the objectives, really there's two objectives we have here. Um, we want um, you to leave this uh, webinar aware of what a buried structure is and where it's uh, viable and advantageous. And we also want you to understand if you're using a buried structure, how to incorporate um, resilience to sustainability aspects to that. The outline will quickly introduce buried structures, then we'll go through the um, design evolution of uh, bridge crossings and culverts and uh, how we got to sustainability and resilience being more uh, relevant today. Uh, we'll go through some of the better practices for uh, sustainability of uh, these structures. Uh, we'll present a couple case studies and then we'll have uh, the objectives uh, review and uh, Q&A at the end. So as far as the capabilities, um, buried structures, buried bridges and culverts are all kind of used in interchangeably here. Um, but really a culvert is a structure that has span less than three meters and a buried bridge or Ferry bridge has expanded greater than three meters. Two types of classifications. It can be open or closed bottom structures. And what open bottom structures are is they're, um, the, the shape of them is maybe a semicircle or an arc, and the underside of the um, structure is supported on a footing system. A closed structure is a structure that has a continuous periphery, would be shaped like an ellipse or a, or a pipe or a circle, and the structure itself forms the foundation. We'll have uh, in steel, you can have single spans up to 35 meters. You can have crossings that are once one uh, conduit, or like the picture shown here, a multiple conduit. In aluminum, you can have spans up to 14 meters. And the other aspect is the vertical clearance. So that is the distance from the, on the road underneath to the, the road surface crossing over the structure. General rule of thumb is you want that to be bigger than 0.22 of the span. If we look at some of the evolution in the, the bridge industry, um, really where, where design standards first kind of started was focusing on safety. Uh, public wanted to have infrastructure that could be reliable and safe to cross. Uh, so we wanted to standardize the practice and, and define the minimum set of criteria to result in a safe cross. Once the safety got under um, a bit better control and understanding and standardize. The next evolution was uh, more on the durability. So we have bridges that are safe, but then we started to realize, well, they don't, bridges don't necessarily last forever. Um, all materials break down. It's just a matter of how susceptible the material we use is to the environment as the environment is exposed to and how long it'll last. If you look at the automobile industry, say in the 70s and 80s, you saw a lot of vehicles driving around the road like this with with a lot of corrosion problems. If you look at the automobiles on the road today, there's been a lot of innovation in the materials used and the coatings used. You don't see the same challenges because they started designing intentionally for durability and innovating on the material side. The same is true for the, um, uh, the Berry Bridge and Culvert industry. Um, there's been a lot of uh, work on how to design for durability, so the decisions being made today from a durability perspective are different than what they were 50 years ago. And there's also different coatings and products to handle um, the environment a bit better um, than there was before. The next sort of wave in the evolution was, was quality. So we started having safe structures, it could be durable, but then we started to realize that, well, maybe if they weren't built properly, or maybe if there was an error in, in the way some of the components were made, those problems can cause performance issues. So I'd say in the 90s and 2000s, you started getting a bit more of a quality focus and uh, focusing on getting quality aspects into the design standards. So what brings us to today, and what are today's challenges? We have a lot of uh, strict resources and a lot of demands, both on, uh, on a fiscal and a um, human capital perspective, uh, whether it be maintenance or whether it be trying to of advance our infrastructure. We have public frustration when there's unexpected road closures, whether they be from washouts, 
or um, debris accumulation or whatever the reason. And we have, um, from a biodiversity perspective, there are going to be challenges as far as um, connectivity, whether it be fish and aquatic or whether it be terrestrial. Uh, wildlife uh, roads are, are a barrier that is causing some biodiversity connectivity challenges. There's also natural resource uh, shortages in some of the, uh, the regions. And of course, extreme hydraulic events are uh, growing in prominence with uh, climate change and some of the elements um, accentuating the, the risks of extreme hydraulic events are if you have urbanization in an area or, deforest or deforestation getting water into the, um, into the channels uh, faster. Um, climate change impacts, of course, and also any debris um, that's, that's at crossings. If you're having an extreme hydraulic event, that is accentuating the potential damage that uh, debris could be causing. So with that, I'm going to, um, uh, we have a few polls. Um, um, and then if you could bring up the, uh, the first poll. And people could just take a, a second to, to read through that and uh, fill in some responses. We want to better understand uh, what some of the challenges are. Okay, that's great. Thank you. That gives us uh, good insight in biodiversity and uh, asset management seem to be the key ones there. Um, so this Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code, there's a new version of it coming out in 2019. And there's, there's a few relevant changes there as far as sustainability in this version of the code. So the first thing CSA did is when we were looking at um, the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code is Let's do a literature review and look at all the um, codes in the English-speaking world and see how often the word climate change is mentioned. And if I remember correctly, there's only one bridge standard that mentions the word climate change, and that's in New Zealand as well. So in this go-around of the uh, Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code, um, there's a review of the entire code where we went through and said, well, how can we um, incorporate aspects into the bridge code to recognize climate change and promote better adoption to climate change. Section two of the code, uh, there's a lot of work done there. And section two of the code was written as uh, durability in the existing uh, versions. In the 2019 version, it's been re renamed to durability and sustainability. And they've added the definition of sustainability and resilience and what that means from the bridge code's perspective. key element in section uh, two is clause 2.4, the design for sustainability. And what's significant here is it starts off saying the design of the structure shall, so that means it's mandatory now, um, consider sustainability in essence. And it's upon consultation with the owners, and then it gives some guidance on how to consider sustainability from the social, economic, and environmental perspective. I've bolded some of the more relevant themes for the, uh, the presentation here. But, but in essence, what the bridge code's doing is it's saying you need to start considering sustainability. It's up to owners to decide what is sustainability to them for their project. And then it's up to designers to figure out how to meet those challenges after that. There really isn't a lot, of, is not a lot of prescriptive guidance in the bridge code of how to do that. What we're hoping this presentation will help you do today is knowing that that owners and, and uh, consultants are going to be faced with the challenge of trying to design for sustainability is we want to give you information on uh, varied structures and how to make them more sustainable and how to make them more resilient and how to meet your sustainability needs a little better. So if we go into a few of the uh, uh, specifics, first one we're going to start off with the economics. A few years ago there is a um, workshop that was hosted by the Transportation Research uh, Board. And the question of the workshop was, how do varied bridges compare to traditional beam bridges? And we looked at it through the accelerated bridge construction lens. What the conclusions were is varied bridges 
um, compared to traditional beam bridges. You're going to have less construction time. You're going to require less construction equipment to build them, which is going to facilitate more local contractors, more local work, um, more competitive bids. And your install cost is going to be, in general, 33 to 67% less than that of a traditional beam bridge. If you look at some of the case studies here, you can see them ranging from small to multi-million dollar projects, um, different parts of, uh, of the country. Um, you have New Brunswick and British Columbia, Ohio, DOT, you got some private jobs there. And you'll see that it's a 33 to 69% um, lower install cost with the ferry bridge compared to the tradition. So a lot of economical advantage in these types of solutions. If you look from a maintenance and durability perspective, on the right-hand side, we've got a traditional bridge and a bridge deck. Um, sometimes they'll have expansion joints. Expansion joints are um, areas where stuff like salt-laden water can get in and attack your primary structural element. You also have the running surface of the bridge is a, is a structural element. That running surface is going to be attacked, whether it be UV rays, uh, vehicular traffic, uh, chemical additives like, uh, like salt, road salts. That's going to be constantly attacking your road or your uh, structural element. If you look at the left on a uh, buried structure, um, you can see the primary structural element is actually buried, and it's not the road surface. So you got an insulating effect um, from the soil between the top of the structure and the road surface, and that's going to help um, protect the structure, and it's going to be attacked less directly. From a durability perspective. Um, in the metal industry, there is a few different um, materials and coatings. On the left-hand side, you have aluminum products, which have been used for 50 or 60 years. Aluminum works well in uh, marine environments and when you have a high chloride environment. And it's also very lightweight, so it's um, relatively easy to, uh, to lift and assemble. In the middle, you have a, um, a thermal polymer coating over a, um, a steel plate. And that's a barrier coating. This is a product that's been in, for, in uh, the market for about 10 or 15 years. It works well when you have soft water and when you have high chloride um, environments. On the right, we have galvanized steel. That's probably the oldest product that's been used since the 1930s. It's a product that works well when, the, when it's in hard water or when it's out of the water. Um, when galvanized steel is used in soft water or high salt environments, it does have some performance challenges and the aluminum and uh, the thermal polymer materials and coatings are, are the materials of choice in those environments. Some of the better practices is when you're dealing with a high road salt um, environment. Um, you can put a membrane between the road surface and the structure to redirect salt-laden water away, away from the structure, or you can look at different materials like the polymer coating, coated steel or aluminum. And when you have um, roads going underneath the structure, and you have the potential risk of um, salt-laden snow being snow plowed up against the structure, you can, again, look at uh, different barriers and uh, different materials to um, offer you uh, more durability in those environments. Moving into the hydraulic sizing, uh, if we look at some of the history of hydraulic sizing, uh, before there's a lot of product innovations in the buried structure industry, you're generally limited to, say, a, a 10 or 12-foot uh, span condom. So if you're trying to get more water to, across the other side of the road, your solution was, we'll just add more conduits. Well, the challenge is uh, debris. If you have a, a stick come across, the jams on the inlet, that's going to plug up your inlet pretty quickly and choke off um, your, your hydraulic capacity and that can lead to a, a failure. There's an interesting study done in California, and uh, what they did is they looked at how do culverts fail. Culverts they defined as less than six meters in diameter. They looked at a 12-year storm and an extreme hydraulic event. And the two takeaways I thought were interesting in that primarily um, buried structures are sized based on how much end area you need to get water to the other side of the road. Well, only about 10% of the failures are based on that hydraulic capacity not being good enough. So you can look at it in positive light, saying, hey, we're doing a really great job of sizing these structures so they have adequate hydraulic capacity. You could also look at it from the other perspective of 
our one design criteria for how to size these structures is missing 90% of the failures. So our, our takeaway is, what if we were to design these structures considering these other failure mechanisms? You're probably going to get a more resilient uh, structure. Look at a philosophy for how to design for resilience, and this is talking about resilience to extreme hydraulic events. For a buried structure, there's really only one of four ways um, the system can fail. You got soil, you got the structure, both need to, need to work together to have the system be performing. The Canadian Highway Bridge Design Goal Code provides guidance on how to perform a structure that's not going to be damaged. If we look at the definition of resilience, it's to in essence, accommodate the unexpected and uh, minimize downtime and disruption to society. So you can have various combinations of structure and soil damage and various consequences on the, on the recovery time. What we want to do is either have a level one, or in some cases, a level two um, type of scenario. What we want to avoid is what we see in the bottom right there, where you have a structure failure and an embankment failure. That's a type of situation where you're going to have a long road closure. So we want to try and eliminate or minimize the disruption to society with our resilience design. A few particular uh, risks, we got um, perched and plugged structures. So on the left, if you're, if you're trying to reduce the risk of having a perched structure, some ways to do that is if you have an open bottom structure or you have a larger span structure which keeps the structure away from the stream, um, and you have a deep, if you're using a closed bottom structure, you bury the invert quite a bit. A guideline is not only just size the structure to convey enough water across, but you size it relative to the natural stream width. Um, there's there's a general guideline in some jurisdictions that you take your natural stream width, you increase it by 20%, and that's the minimum span of the structure. That gives you some more resilience against uh, uh, perch structures. On the plug structure, some recommendations are, the first thing is to go to the site and look upstream. What is the potential debris loading here? What is the potential, whether it be settlement or, um, or trees or anything else? And then size the structure to better handle uh, debris or put in features to reduce the risk of debris impacting the structure. On a scour perspective, with, with the um, climate change, there's an increased risk of deeper foundation scours. Um, so some ways to do that is if you're using a closed bottom structure, make sure you have lots of bit, lots of bury on the invert. If you're using an open bottom structure, keep your footings further away from the stream. So if you have your banks scouring out, the structure is less impacted. You can also put sheet piling um, in front of the uh, the foundation system to better protect uh, the foundation system if there is a large scour event. Another solution is uh, using geotextile, re geotextile reinforced soil, or GRS, buried structures. On the left there, what you'll see is a, is a geotextile layer that runs the entire length of the structure, and they're vertically spaced about every 250 to 300 millimeters. What it does is, is it, in essence, it sandbags the soil. So if you have a high hydraulic event and you have water running through the backfill, the geotextile is going to help keep that backfill in place. You can also look at the, the particles in, in the soil that you're using and use a, use a type of backfill gradation that's going to be less susceptible to flowing water. Looking at structure shapes, there's ways you can choose structure shapes where the structure relies less on the soil and more um, able to uh, withstand with its structural damage if there is any soil damage. Here's an example of a um, extreme hydraulic event. So you can see you got a a lot of water backed up at the inlet. You have the head wall here. Head walls are key for reducing the amount of water getting into the backfill. You can see on the right there when the water receded, the head wall and the geotextile reinforced structure um, held, and there was no disruption to society on this cross. Another one is um, intentionally designing the structure so it can withstand soil damage. Now, traditionally, you design a structure so the soil doesn't fail and so the structure doesn't fail under predicted conditions. I think our ability to be able to predict conditions for all structures for 75 years, we're not going to be perfect there. So if, if you have a highly important structure, 
you can look at intentionally designing it so if the soil is damaged, then um, the structure is not damaged, you rebackfill the structure, and you can uh, have the structure open in a matter of days or weeks as opposed to longer road closures. Shifting more into the environmental um, lens, I think there's, um, on, on this slide in particular, there's a lot of mutually reinforcing benefits of the designing a structure for resilience and designing a structure so it's um, a better meeting biodiversity needs. You look at this structure, the span is outside the natural stream width, you get a bit of room on the right hand side there. Um, that could be for wildlife passage. Um, that promotes more wildlife passage through the conduit rather than over, over the structure or um, for, for preventing um, wildlife connectivity altogether. Um, you have more light under the structure, which is going to promote more passage. You have um, your aquatic um, aspects that are, are untouched, so, so it's better from a fish passage perspective. And by meeting these, these environmental criteria, you're also getting a more resilient structure than that you can have more area for debris passage, more area for, for hydraulic conveyance. Some of the other environmental aspects to look at are um, of what materials are you using. Um, this is a project where this recycled concrete aggregate was used for the entire uh, backfill. The steel was almost 100% recycled steel. The steel is 100% recyclable. So it's a very high, high recycled reuse content on this project. If you're working in an urban environment, the idea of potentially reusing materials um, is, is an option. Shifting over to uh, greenhouse gas, um, so, so Dr. Dew in 2015, she performed a life cycle assessment uh, between steel and concrete bridges in Sweden. She looked at um, a number of crossings, all of them having spans less than 33 meters, and two key themes that came out of her study is the first one is that the environmental impact of the bridge cross crossing is closely related to the bridge material. You're going to have construction, you're going to have transportation efforts, but in large part, the material footprint is related to the, uh, well, well, the environmental footprint is closely related to the material. The other aspect is that steel bridges uh, produced approximately half the global warming potential of that compared to concrete bridges. There's an environmental product declaration. It's available through the uh, Corrugated Steel Pipe Institute. And um, what that does is that quantifies the environmental footprint per unit of uh, steel that's used for a, uh, for a culvert or a, uh, a buried bridge. And there's also an environmental product declaration out there for uh, concrete. And just comparing, or have, having a look at the two environmental product declarations, it suggests that um, for steel, you're also going to have a less um, environmental footprint from a, global, from a greenhouse gas emissions, which um, supports um, the life cycle assessment done by uh, Dr. Duke. Looking at it from a lead perspective, um, looking at the steel product, if you're looking for lead points on a project, there is a potential for up to seven points by using this. So there are some environmental uh, benefits from the uh, steel products as well. With that, um, we have our uh, second poll. The question is, just of the things we, uh, topics we went through, um, which one of the topics do you think had the most insightful information? Thank you. So with that, um, I'm going to ask uh, Phil to uh, talk about a couple of case studies. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Kevin. Uh, out here on the West Coast, so good morning, everybody here. Uh, speaking of the West Coast, there's a picture of BC on the right there. Uh, the first uh, site I just wanted to talk to you about is uh, it's a BC MOT project, Roy Creek, um, 2016. Uh, a culvert replacement. Uh, it was a, about a 12 foot span, 
uh, pipe arch on um, on a two lane paved road. So galvanized steel, probably in there for you know probably the better part of 40 or 50 years. Uh, very fish sensitive area. Uh, so this is a you know primarily trying to uh, remove the culvert and also put in something that's um, to be fish possible and fish friendly. So the Ministry of Transportation out there works with uh, local stream keepers, uh, and their intention is to restore salmon and trout habitat. And so there's a lot of themes in that. Uh, the first thing I did when I went to the site well before you saw the fish on the left was actually go check out the water what my driving it. So I uh, I just took a water sample and put it out in about three seconds. The galvanized steel probably wouldn't work very well in a polymer coated steel wood. So I suggest people start doing that just so they can come up with a, a more sustainable solution. So the solution that you know came up was uh, using a, a GRS arch. So uh, I mentioned earlier, I think Kevin had that a GRS arch is geosynthetic reinforced soil. Um, that explains what the dotted lines are. Uh, you can see you run it horizontally. So each of those is layers of geotextile. Uh, it's a high strength geotextile, it's a, uh, very permeable. And what its function is there to do is stiffen that backbone and blow it up, up so that it uh, can carry a lot more load than just conventional soil. So the arch itself is self supporting and it, it sits on a compacted boulder bed with sand infill. So there's a lot of care and attention goes into that. In this case, we had a nice, uh, fairly stiff, um, foundation to put it on. So, um, and settlement was water and it's very, little settlement and um, as it went along that the people start to realize that GRS actually encapsulates the, the bill and, and it helps a lot of um, scour and backfill pipers. So far it has this site has not been tested to that. So there hasn't been a giant flood like some of the other structures we've seen. So the size of the structure 6.6 .6 by 1.8 meter rise about 20 meters long. Um, so we, we did look at it initially looking at it on spread footings uh, and it would have reduced the, the uh, available fish habitat inside the structure by, by a little bit. I think the footings would have been about 1.1 meters wide. So by, by doing that, uh, yeah, it maximized the fish habitat. So the technology for GRS has been around for a while. If anybody wants to read more about it, uh, FP Innovations, I think, put together some great pieces going dating back to 2005. Uh, since then, it's been used. Oh, and BC municipalities, Alberta oil and gas, Northwest Territories, EOT, as well as Yukon EOT. So here's what it looks like when it shows up to the site. Um, it's just basically everything you need to build it is on is on one truck, one D train. So uh, it can be just lifted off with an excavator, and uh, you can almost start building it immediately. So there's no cranes or no heavy lifting here. It's all pretty conventional stuff. The other thing is, these are really, I guess, suited really well for remote sites. So, you know, we're looking at projects uh, uh, in Yukon now that probably the materials will all ship to CCAN, that they're for several, uh, maybe a month or two outside. So uh, it lends itself well to, you know, really remote sites. Um, once you want to start building it, here's just a picture of, uh, this is generally when I show up again, is to help the local people put it together. Uh, they're, they're not high-end journeymen, whatever, specialists, these folks are, I just train them as we go on how to build together. So um, we, you know, spend a few days just holding it up and um, it's just, you got to get a little staging area next to where, you know, the crossing is uh, and you build three ring sub-assemblies and fly them in with, with an excavator. So again, there's nothing really outrageous about, there's no giant cranes or anything, um, it's just me and some people. Here's some pictures. Uh, this is after you get the boulder bed and the foundation installed and you spent some time compacting it. Uh, and it shows the first uh, ring going in. You can kind of see a layer of uh, boulders. Um, they're just on either side of the, the creek bed. So those, those are designed to go uh, inside the structure. So you apply those pieces in and hold them up. So the, the whole thing, I think the assembly takes generally a day or two to, to happen. It's not a big production. Uh, this show this picture here just shows a um, you know the, the backfill going in. In this case, you used a really good crush material, a four-inch crush. Um, you can use you know you know the natural material that comes out of a bank. We've done that lots in the resource sector. Uh, that would certainly reduce the cost of the structure. But given this was an 
MOTI project. Um, yeah, they wanted to use a really high quality brand material and, and skinny with lifts. So the uh, the uh, end end walls on these uh, that's just a work in progress here of putting the um, uh, wire mesh and uh, it's called a mirror mesh fascia fabric. It goes on the end, so that green stuff is is permeable. It allows uh, you know plants to grow through almost well within days on Vancouver Island. It seems to such a, a nice environment uh, for growing stuff. So in this case, I think uh, the ministry you know person actually put put willows in and all kinds of different plants to yeah foster more of a natural looking thing so for fish and insects to, to actually show up. Uh, the other thing we've done is with uh, with the galvanized wire end walls we've kind of experimented with different materials. Uh, actually use stainless steel. There's some talk of using other materials too for, for additional service length. So just to finish off the value scorecard on the project uh, the, it, it's an innovative project, that's for sure. It was the first MOTI GRS arch on a, on a paved road. Um, and, you know, lower maintenance, um, it, it will provide, you know, more spring weather resilience. Obviously, the intent of the project was to provide, you know, greater uh, fish uh, passage. And, um, yeah, those vegetated walls and a, and a fairly speedy installation. Uh, the whole thing from start to finish took about four to six weeks. Uh, Cost-wise, and all-in cost is about four hundred thousand. Um, that probably could have been reduced if you went with, you know, a lighter wall thickness or, or galvanic steel or or just you know gravel you could find at your local gravel pit. Um, but uh, yeah, it was all in all a very successful project, and I really have to thank Sean Wong here for uh, his work in the ministry and was involved with the project and providing these photos. So. Uh, the second case history I wanted to go through, uh, this is Grizzly Creek. Uh, again, because I live in the you know, pictures up not far from where I live. Um, it seems in, in uh, the northern BC area, we seem to be getting a lot of floods uh, in the last well, few years anyway. This was the first major one in memory, uh, 2011. Just a crazy storm that went on for two days. It, I think there was 11 washouts on Highway 97. 97 is the main link between sort of middle and northern BC, so it's Incredibly important to keep that road open. Right beside this road, there was CN Rail, and they were shut down for a while as well. So, Grizzly Creek itself uh, started off. Uh, the original pipe was a 900 millimeter diameter pipe. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody actually found the pipe. I think it kind of got washed out, flew down into the ditch somewhere. Uh, what they were left with was just a chasm and a road that could not be passable. So what they replaced it with, uh, I guess before I start, this is, you know, an amazing structure if you're a structural guy like me and Kevin. I, this is not a fish-friendly one, I, at least I don't think it is. Um, it's, it's basically a, uh, it's designed to carry water and cobble through it and very efficiently. It's a, a 5.6 by 3.6 meter structural plate. Um, and it is, it is over-designed, uh, in my opinion, in a lot of ways, just for uh, pure abrasion. And um, you know, just all of performance. So it's designed to carry cobble and rock through it. And with that, uh, you've got that armor plating in the bottom. It's fully detachable. You can pull it out and replace it anytime you want. Um, it's got a very robust end treatment on it. That explains what the concrete's all about. So it's got a cutoff well. It goes right down and it's cast right into bedrock. And then um, a bevel ring runs around the periphery of it. So it's it's designed for you know hydraulic uplift. Get an extreme event. Uh, the, the, you know, this culvert is not going to go anywhere. Also, there's a trash rack, which I'll we'll talk in a few minutes about. So, the project uh, took about two months to build and went right into late winter, and they're back pulling 24 hours a day to get this thing built. There's the trash rack. Uh, it was designed by McElhaney out of Prince George. A lot of advice from Northwest Hydraulics on how to do it. Uh, the design of it is basically to intercept any debris going through it. That goes back to that pie chart that uh, um, Kevin talked about in California showing. A lot of culverts basically fail from debris plugging it up. That's really what this is all about, is preventing that from happening. It's a nice sunny day, northern BC, uh, in between storms. Uh, you can kind of see the overall application. Uh, I'll just get 
my arrow going here. So hopefully it works. There's the trash rack upstream. Uh, there's the downhill end. And then there's a big cut up wall and an apron here to, you know, uh, for energy dissipation. And you can look upstream here, it's just forest. And with that, uh, it just carries a lot of cobble and three big events. There's the uh, downhill end, uh, just kind of talked about a minute ago. Uh, it's got the energy dissipating uh, structure there at the end, so when the rocks are flying out, um, it basically won't carve a hole vertically down into that punch pool. So, um, yeah, pretty robust structure. Uh, it's not a lot of uh, times you can say you can test the structure to its you know, uh, full capacity, but in this case, it's northern BC, so 2016 had a big flood. And uh, there's a really good aerial photo of Northwest Hydraulic, uh, by the way. And it kind of shows, uh, yeah, that's the inlet. Let me grab the arrow here. Uh, make the arrow work. So that's the inlet. There's your the big V shaped thing. And it's water ponding upstream and debris, you know, settling out. And then the water just goes flying through the bottom of the road, underneath the road. So in this case, it worked great. So that, that was the good news. Now, one of the things that just uh, just from an operations uh, perspective, uh, this is what we saw in the picture on the left. It's essentially that debris piling up of rocks and cobble and all kinds of stuff. Uh, the picture on the right is well afterwards. You can walk down there with a you know a, a track excavator and basically pull it all out and restore it to what it was supposed to look like in the beginning. So that's a lot easier to do than trying to pull pipe pull material out from inside the structure. Um, so I guess just wrap, wrapping things up here, I think one of the, the themes is um, we know there's sustainability and resilience challenges. There's ideas and opportunities out there to do things uh, differently. We have we have some suggestions. I think the main takeaway is let's let's innovate and do things differently and stop doing the same thing and expecting different results. So if we just go back and quickly review the objectives, um, the first one is when are buried structures viable and advantageous? Well, these three, three criteria. The first one is making sure there's a backfill material locally available, whether that's virgin aggregate or um, uh, recycled reusable aggregate. Um, item two is making sure that the single span is less than uh, 35 meters. And item three was making sure you have the vertical clearance criteria. The second one is um, better practices for sustainable and resilient uh, cross. So if there's um, there's lots of stuff we mentioned in the presentation. I think the one one of the main takeaways would be if, if you have any message from this, when you're sizing a structure for a hydraulic crossing, don't size it just based on how much end area you need to get water to the other side. Also consider the stream bank width. And um, the 1.2 number is is the number we've seen commonly used. So um, just consider uh, sizing these structures uh, differently. The other suggestion is, is just innovate. And um, if you refer to, uh, we have a handout attached here. Um, just refer to the sustainability um, checklist handout. It's um, got some of the high level themes on this um, on the presentation. It can serve as a reminder if you're working on a project. Um, if, if you're ever wanting to use this, and you're working on a project and you're not sure what it means or how ideas and how it could apply, uh, feel free to call myself or Phil and we'd be happy to uh, discuss the project with you and, and see if we can uh, collaborate and uh, I'll learn together on how to do this, uh, how to do this stuff better. So I'm just gonna finish up with a uh, final story. Um, so this is a picture from the Cougar Creek flood um, in Alberta for, uh, from a few years ago. The structure was uh, designed in the uh, early 80s, and there's two east-west crossings in the area. There's this crossing in Canmore, and there's the Trans-Canada uh, crossing. When the Kruger Creek um, flood happened, you can see it's a huge mass of hydraulic events, much larger than the other uh, structure. Um, the road washed out, the structure was okay. The structure had a head wall there protecting it. It had a um, had invert in the structure to protecting it from debris. The condo was probably about half full of, of uh, cobble and debris. The water receded in a couple of days after the event. Maintenance crews went in and cleaned out the conduits. They re the structure. 
and this crossing was open in about a week. Further downstream uh, on the Trans-Canada Highway, um, the abutments for some of the bridges on the Trans-Canada Highway were compromised. It took a few weeks to re rehabilitate them, but because of the, uh, when this Cougar Creek picture uh, shown here was designed with the resilience enhancements originally, um, there was less disruption to society because there was a crossing open in a matter of a few days to, to a week, and you could keep that east-west passage open. So with that, that wraps up our um, presentation. We just had one last uh, quick poll before we go into uh, questions. So we just wanted to be um, uh, interested in knowing what area you would like to know more about with uh, buried structures. Thank you. Some, uh, some great feedback. Perfect. Thanks so much, Kevin and Phil. That was great. Um, if you scroll up in the chat box area there, we do have some questions. So we have about uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, again, if everybody would like to use the chat box, you can go ahead and type out your message there. Um, but if you're on the conference call line with us, we prefer to ask a question over the telephone. Um, just hit star six and that will unmute your line. Um, and I'll come to the conference call line in just a moment here. Um, so Kevin and Phil, the first question here is from Alex. So he's asking, how much did the polymer coating of the structural plate cost for the Roy Creek project? Uh, Phil here, I, I can probably answer that. Uh, it's, it adds about, on, on average, to any kind of structure, about uh, 25%, maybe 30%. Uh, it sounds like a lot, but, um, you know, if you consider if you're in really soft water or any kind of hot soils, it, it, there is really no other option. Yeah. And just to, to build on that, Phil, so or just, just to clarify, you're talking 25% on the material cost, not the installed cost, correct? All right, thanks so much. Um, we have a, uh, a comment and a question here from Phil North, and I'm just going to read it out so we have that on the recording for everyone who's listening afterwards. Um, but over the last 30 years, we've made progress accommodating fish, fish passage. Crossings now routinely consider the ability of juvenile and adult fish to swim through the structure. However, we still do not treat the stream as a dynamic system that it is. We want to fix the stream in place. The stream channel is part of a constantly changing system, the valley, the valley, whether um, small or big, is dynamic and getting more so with climate change. Uh, the resiliency of the stream ecosystem is dependent on the dynamic nature of the valley system. So do you think we are anywhere near considering valley dynamics in uh, road crossing design? Still here. Um, I guess I'm not a real expert in this, but, but what I will say is um, there's still people designing structures purely for hydraulics and not for um, sediment movement or debris passage. And yeah, so that that's just an observation. I don't, you know, that's kind of what I see on a daily basis. Perfect. Thanks, Phil. Um, Lena had a question here about case study two. Is the project fish passable with the drop uh, on the downstream end? And I think Catherine answered that no, it wasn't, uh, didn't require passability, but just to confirm with you guys if that's uh, the case. I, I think Catherine is right, and she would be better equipped to say that <laughs> than me. Um, um, anyway, in her role in the project, probably. Um, yeah, my knowledge is no, it didn't require passage. It was purely hydraulic. Okay. Great. Thanks for thanks for confirming. Uh, another question here: uh, Do buried structures require a Fisheries Act authorization? Uh, 
It's failure. I, I think so. If you, you need a permit to go out and build these on fish sensitive creeks. Um, again, I'm not a biologist, I'm just a civil engineer, but they, you do have to have the right permits. Perfect. Uh, the next question here is from Eric uh, and others. Uh, what are the benefits of a concrete and treatment? Okay. Um, I, do you want to take this one? Down sure, yeah. So there'll be a couple of advantages. One of them is if you get um, water backed up, um, the concrete will be less permeable to water and you're going to get less water into, into the road and into the soil embankment. And what you want to try and do is, is try and keep the water or the road embankment because as soon as you get water in the road embankment, you get the soil particles moving and you tend to get a bit more, a higher risk of the road eroding away. Um, so I'd say the primary benefit is to keep water out of um, uh, where the soil is and keep the soil in place. Yeah, I, I, I can jump in there too. Concrete and concrete other materials as well. Yeah, I, I can jump in there too, Eric. Uh, basically, two parts on, on, on the second case history there was a cutoff wall that went, it was tied to bedrock, and that cutoff wall prevented any kind of piping below the pipe. Um, and the second thing is just, just that ring beam that runs around the beveled end uh, in an extreme hydraulic event where you get a lot of surcharge. We get, we get a tremendous amount of hydraulic uplift. And um, by having that ring beam in there, uh, it resists that uplift and will save the structure from falling apart. So on a major structure, you should have concrete ring beams. That, that's just an opinion on something that's liable to you know, have that. Perfect. Thanks, Kevin and Phil. Uh, the next question here is from uh, uh, Hanon. So, what is the expected structure lifespan? I would say um, the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code requires that the structures be designed for 75 years unless the owner wants something different. Um, so, typically, they're designed for 75 year um, low maintenance um, conditions. Uh, the BC government will require a 100-year uh, service life. Um, some private owners require 50 years, so um, generally between 50 and 100 years is, is what we design for. And um, if the right material is used in the right environment, you will be able to achieve that. Perfect. Thanks, Kevin. Um, the next question is from Alex here. Uh, is there any design material out there to account for debris passage when designing barrier structures? Uh, there is, um, so, so the BSPI, Corrugated Steel Pipe Institute, has a performance guideline. In that guideline, it talks about water velocities and bed load going through the structures, and it has guidelines on what materials will be um, acceptable for what type of environment. Um, it, in general, if, um, if you're in a lower velocity, lower bed load environments, you can have um, steel and aluminum in the water. As soon as you get into the higher velocities, you got to either look at polymer coating or having an open bottom structure so the water flows primarily against the um, uh, bedding and not abrading against the, uh, the structure. Yeah, uh, there's also, uh, there is material out there, uh, the same study that with the pie charts that showed the, you know, uh, that was in our presentation. It was put together um, by um, a person that works for the BLM in the U.S. And um, I, I can probably dig up that and send it over to Alex or any other people who are interested. Perfect. We have a couple of comments here about the uh, Fisheries Act authorization. So Sean Wong said proper design and construction of structures for fish, fish passage may not require a Fisheries Act authorization. Um, and Hanan says that all in or near water construction projects need to go through DFO consultation before work starts. So just a couple of comments there. Um, I see some people typing, but I just want to go to the conference call line to see if there's anybody that would like to ask a question over the phone. If so, just hit star six on your phone.
If no questions there, we'll give everybody a couple of uh, seconds here. And if there's any last minute questions for uh, Kevin and Phil. There's a couple more comments there about the um, uh, fish uh, authorization. All right, last call. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Phil. I, I was just going to say, um, if, um, if any any people in the audience have any uh, suggestions of content they think would be valuable to add to um, this uh, knowledge deck, um, just reach out to Phil and I. Uh, I know there's a lot of people on the call with expertise in uh, areas that Phil and I do not. Um, so we welcome that um, information. Perfect. And if uh, I guess we'll we'll kind of wrap things up since there are no more questions. But if anybody has any questions, uh, Kevin and Phil's email are are on the uh, first slide of the presentation. Um, so with that, I guess we will wrap things up. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Um, it's obviously a very very big thank you to Kevin and Phil uh, for a great presentation. Um, any last comments from either of you before we sign off? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming and appreciate the opportunity to uh, to talk. Yeah, and, uh, on, on my behalf, uh, yeah, I really appreciate your opportunity and having the you know, having a chance to talk about some of this stuff. I I am actively looking for other examples of uh, you know, these systems out there. If anybody has any, um, this is really instructive. And seeing the practical part of this whole thing, it's it's great that stuff's showing up at great shows, but it's just the practical end. And learn a lot from these issues. So, if anybody out there from you know other parts of Canada, North America, want to get a hold, show, show us stuff. That would be just awesome. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you to you both. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on today. And uh, with that, we'll sign off here, and we'll uh, we'll catch you on the next webinar, guys. Have a great day. Thanks, guys.